All right. What's up, everyone? So this is my first uh, attempt at live streaming in a long minute. So please bear with me. I'm not sure if it's going to work. It looks like it's working. And uh, I'm not sure how it's going to work. But I wanted to hop on and just give it a go. So hopefully uh, some people will join me here. Uh, let's see if I can get into here. Hmm. See, I'm going to see if I can see myself on YouTube that I'm live streaming. Yeah, it looks like it's working. Cool. Okay, so anyway, I hope everyone's having a good Monday. Uh, I wanted to answer a bunch of questions. I get mm -hmm. questions from people all the time. <clears throat> and I get a lot of questions about, obviously, Fujifilm, gear, cameras, lenses, editing. So I'm going to answer some of those questions, but I also get a lot of questions about portrait photography, uh, like running a photo business. So it's kind of all over the map, which is cool. So today I want to go through some of those questions and answer them. And so I have some of them here that I screenshot because I had asked this in uh, uh, link, uh, Instagram and on here. Okay, so let's just get right into it. I'm just going to go in whatever order I have here. So one question I got, how about posing? How do you let folks that are not models, how do you get folks who are not models into good poses? Yeah, that's tough. It's tough to pose people. Um, the simple answer is when it's someone who's not a model and honestly sometimes models also don't know how to pose, uh, it really depends on the person and, and how they understand what their body's gonna look like on film. So you have to basically uh, pose them. So how do you pose them? Well, it depends. It depends on their body shape, their body size. It depends on uh, men versus women. Different poses work better for different age groups. There's really no one answer. Um, but what I will say is that uh, the more you do it, the more you'll find poses that work for different kinds of people. And... Uh, body types and things like that, ages. One great resource for that that helped me a lot that I reference quite a bit uh, is uh, Lindsay Adler's posing book. It's really good, so I suggest you get that. Second thing I suggest is that you just find lots of inspiration images. Like I'm, I look at photo books all the time and and also Instagram of, of photographers who I admire and whose work I like. And then I basically will screenshot and make like reference guides of those poses. And then I will wind up, you know, trying similar poses the next time I have a client. So that's, that's basically how you do it. All right, let's see what else we got here. <clears throat> Are you all about the bass? No treble. This. <laughs> okay, so some of you know that I'm a bass player. And in addition to being a photographer, I play the uh, upright bass and the electric bass. And yes, I'm all about the bass. And uh, all right, where do you get most of your leads from? Ah, this is a good question. Most of my leads come from my website. So now we're talking the business of photography. We're right into it. And most of my leads come from my website where uh, I basically have it optimized so that I can... Um, hang in there so that I can uh, get people to contact me. So that's that's basically how that happens specifically for me. My website, I get leads from a lot of places though. I get them from Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. So I think the real answer to that question is you want to have a diverse way of getting leads. You don't want all your leads coming from one spot necessarily. It's okay if you have a bulk of them come from there. I like having the bulk of my leads come from my website because I can control that. If you have the bulk of your leads come from uh, a third-party app like like LinkedIn, for example, and then they change their algorithm, that could be a sticky situation. Okay, let's see what else we got. How do you build rapport with your subjects in front of your camera? This is a great question. Um, I think that the main thing about being a portrait photographer is you have to build trust with people because you have to remember that most people, and again, this is not just like corporate people, regular people who don't have their picture taken all the time. I even have this with a lot of um, clients who are like models or actors. 
they a lot of times don't like being photographed. So I think it's very important um, for you as the photographer to build that rapport with your client. And one way to do it is by just being, you know, cool <laughs> and just having a good personality, making it comfortable for them, making it so that they're not feeling like, oh, this is like an awkward place to be. Um, you know what? Also, building rapport with your clients, the more confident you are as a photographer in your skill set, the more they'll trust you and feel relaxed. One thing I see a lot, like when you have um, like a new photographer uh, working on their portraits is, is they'll, they'll be like this. They'll be like, okay, let's, uh, let's take a picture. And then they're like this behind their camera and they're like pressing buttons and they're looking at the person that they're supposed to be photographing and they look like really nervous and and then they snap the shutter and then they look at the screen and they're like oh, okay I gotta do that again so like that kind of stuff you can't do like even if there's been times where I've taken like the first photo of someone during their session and in my mind I go I look at the screen and, and I go ah this is horrible like I scream in my mind but I don't let them see it I'm always like awesome you look killer you look amazing because I know that even if the first photo doesn't look amazing I'm gonna get them there so confidence um, but again that confidence comes with like having your skill set really really good so you got to get your skill set together too so uh, building a rapport, it takes time. Also, make sure the space you bring people to is welcoming. Don't bring them into a space that, that's not nice looking, that's not clean, that doesn't make them feel invited in. There's a lot of ways you can build your rapport with your client. Another thing, when someone comes in my door, I'm not like, all right, let's go, get behind the camera. I take a minute to get to know them. What do you do? Where are you from? You know, how's, you know, you have, you have kids, you have this, you have that, whatever it is, just to get to know them and make things comfortable. So that's, that's a big part of what I do with them too. Um, and be yourself. Don't try and be someone else. Be yourself and just make it a cool experience. All right. What else do we got here? So most of these are portrait questions so far, but I promise you I will get to those Fuji gear questions because I know that you're all itching to hear about that. I know you started with Peter Hurley to learn headshots. Where did you get so good at portraits? Well, first of all, thank you for that compliment. I really do appreciate that. That's a very nice compliment. And I s started my portrait journey. I kind of, it's v been a very similar journey to my journey as a headshot photographer with Peter. So I'm all about mentorship. I learned pretty much everything about how to take a headshot from Peter Hurley. But then I met um, a photographer at one of Peter's workshops named Ivan Weiss. And Ivan is located in London. And his portrait work spoke incredibly strongly to me uh, right away. And so <clears throat> I basically did the same thing. I, I contacted Ivan and I set up some coachings. And we did quite a few coachings all over Zoom where I would set up a live shoot in my studio. Ivan would be... Uh, streaming from his studio in London to me in New York. And he would work with me, help me set the lights, talk to me about focal lengths, talk to me about um, color grading. I mean, it was, it's was it been amazing. And I still do these with Ivan. I had, a, I, had I met with him live because uh, he's in the Headshot Crew too, and he runs the portrait track. So that's your answer. Go in the Headshot Crew, join it, join the portrait track, and uh, work with Ivan. Um that's been, it's been a, a real, I know people use the word, the term game changer all the time, but working with Ivan has been a game changer for me in my portrait work. All right, let me do this because this is going to actually probably be easier. Okay, let's see. What else do we have here? Next question, how to email reach new customers and business to get new leads? Yeah, I mean, there's really no one answer to this. Like, how do you find new clients. This is the toughest thing for us as photographers. And you have to have a very diversified way of doing this. So for me, it includes lots of things. It includes um, Google ads, which, I, you know, I'm like, I love and hate them at the same time for, for various reasons, but they do help me find clients. It includes active social media presence in um, at least a few apps that you like. Now, if you spread yourself too thin, it's not good either. 
So I say focus on like three or so apps that you really like and that you feel like you can engage with people in. And that makes sense for the kind of clients you're trying to find. You're going to find different clients from Instagram than you will from LinkedIn. Um, if you want to find the best corporate clients, LinkedIn is a good place to go. That's where it's going to happen. Not only that, though, I... I've done things like cold emails where I just email all the law offices in my area, all the finance, um, you know, um, companies in my area uh, to, to, to try and find work, give out flyers. You know, there's, there's tons of things you can do. Um, I think one of the biggest things you need, though, is you need to have a clear goal of who your client is. So a lot of times people feel like, well, I can't find clients, but they don't even know what they want to shoot. So a lot of times you need to clarify that first. If you go to my website, my website is not like monumental and it's not artistic looking either because it's optimized for people who want headshots and portraits who are either business people, actors, or musicians and other kinds of artists. That's all I want. So my website, 1,000%, only does that. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how, how I do that part of it. Uh, let me just see here. So I'm, I'm streaming here. I don't know if, I, if anyone's going to leave me a chat comment. I'm not sure. So I'm not sure how that works. It should pop up in here, but I don't, I don't know. So if it's in there... Um, and, and you leave something, I'll get to it eventually. So that's what I recommend. 100% make sure that you have a website that like reflects the work you want, right? I want corporate clients. I want businesses who want headshots. That's a big part of what I do. And so a big part of my website is geared towards that. That's a great way to help you get clients. All right, another question. Simple portrait retouching techniques that look natural. Oh, yes. So the worst thing, one of the worst things that I hate so much is overly, overly retouched images, right? Oh, God, it's horrible. So first you need to figure out a technique that actually works. You need to not use one of those sliders in some of those softwares where like you can just go from like face detail to like full Kardashian. Just slide it over, and now it's like everyone looks plastic. Don't do that. The there's there's a, some various methods. Um, there's some various methods of like uh, you know retouching. The one that I use is I use frequency separation. So that's a pretty common one because what you do is you create these. Uh, like two layers and then you create a separate layer a third layer or a fourth layer where you apply the um the retouch and then you can do it really really carefully i think i have a video on it actually if you search in the old archive but um you less is more with retouching and so you got to be real careful real careful with that oh look at that so everyone go follow uh, my friend Ben Selly Shots on uh, YouTube, he just left a comment here. Go follow him. He's got a new channel. He just passed like a 1,000 subscribers. He's working his butt off, making great content. Give him a follow. Anyway, Ben asks, building websites are an absolute pain. I find it super hard to cater a site to multiple types of photography. Yeah, I know, man. That That is the challenge. But I'm telling you, like, the... The problem is this, if people go to your website and it's kind of like a jack of all trades photography website, you're going to lose those clients um, who are looking for a very specific thing. Like think about it this way. If a, if a woman is searching for a wedding photographer, she goes to your website and she sees street photography, it's, you're, you're going to lose them. Like they're going to click away and try something else. Um, so you got it, bro. So, you know, my my advice is just suck it up and do it. And and <laughs> I know that sounds that sounds terrible, but like you got to kind of just figure out those things that you want to be paid for shooting. Like for me, it's simple because I don't want to shoot weddings. I would love to shoot weddings, actually. I don't have the time, so it's not something I'm trying to do. But I know for me, I'm only doing portraits and headshots, so it's easy for me to have my website cater to that. And then obviously, I'll get people call me about family photography and real estate photography and things like that. And I do some of that stuff as well, but that's not my main thing. Um, but yeah, I know it's, it's annoying to have multiple sites. Um, but I think the first thing you should do is figure out, well, what is the genre I want to be paid for? Mm, most photographers who are doing like every genre are kind of doing 
all of them okay, but not great. So that's the thing, you know, some, some can excel at everything, but I know that, um, like if you're going to a doctor, you want a specialist, right? So that's how I look at photography. Um, and it also makes you more impressive to people because when people come in here into my studio and they say to me, oh, so do you do like family photos and this and that? I'm like, no, I just basically do headshots and portraits for professionals and artists and musicians. They're like, what, really? That's it? Wow. So it actually makes you even more of seeming like the expert in your field. But, you know, this is just the way I do it. You can, you can definitely do it the other way. I, I use a Squarespace website, which is very easy to edit still kind of annoying and time consuming but what i do is i'll i'll constantly update it but like little at a time instead of trying to do like an overhaul so that's another way um let's see oh here's a, here's a fuji question xt2 to xt5 should i upgrade all right that's a loaded question because so this video um i'm recording on my xt5 and i can't in the streaming app i couldn't really get it i don't know if it's like totally in focus on me so we'll find out uh later but but it the xt5 is is kind of a a controversial camera a little bit because people either love it or hate it now i love it it's been good to me over the past year that i've used it um but it's like the xt5 is definitely not made as well as the older xt models now i have the xt4 here and people People kind of complained a little bit about the build quality even of the four. Uh, mostly they complained about this. <gasps> uh, the dreaded flippy screen. But if you go from an X-T2, um, and that's my buddy Ben Wolf Photo. Follow him because he's an amazing portrait uh, photographer who asked this question. If you go from an X-T2 to an X-T5, you're definitely going to love the autofocus. You're definitely going to love the, the how much faster it is. And... Um, the 40 megapixels, I think, is great. Like, I've had no problem there. Maybe it's slightly more um, noisy in the high ISOs, but <clears throat> I haven't found it to be, like, a huge difference, personally. But you will, you might not like that it's, it feels a little bit cheaper. Now, to me, it feels good in the hand. It has a nice grip. It's, it, they did a nice job on that. But I guess the finish and the, and the, the surfaces feel a little bit less robust. So that's the biggest thing that you might not like. Um, right now, here everyone's buying used X-T3s. So that's what's happening right now. Like I keep seeing videos pop up, like like the Fuji camera everyone should have. And like, and then they'll have it like in a shadow and slowly turning around until you realize it's the X-T3. So I know that's kind of a hot camera right now. And I, I've been thinking of getting one myself actually, um, which I certainly don't need, but uh, that's, that's my take on that. I think you'll be happy with the AF performance. It's going to be a, a very big difference, but it's not, it's not going to feel quite as good. And then one thing that I don't like about the X-T5 that everyone doesn't like about the X-T5, most people, you can't put a grip on it. So I have a grip for my X-T4, which I like to use sometimes with like a bigger lens. All right, let's see. <clears throat> what has been your most successful method for getting new clients. I beg them. I say, please hire me. Please. No, I'm kidding. Of course, I don't do that. Uh, so I kind of talked about this already, but my, for me personally, mo most of my clientele comes through, uh, well, actually, it's two sources right now. It's my website, so through Google, Google Ads. And now that I've been doing this for a number of years, a lot of my clients are word of mouth. So that's another thing. You want, when you get a client, even if you don't have a lot of clients, when you get one, uh, you want to make it like a great experience for them so that you get another one because people who are happy with you will tell their friends and then eventually that kind of becomes a word of mouth thing and those are the best clients because you don't have to sell them now. They already heard from their friend how great you are and they just want to sign up with you. Uh, so this is cool. I actually, not only is the live stream working, but I can see the chat. All right, so uh, let's see, Felix, hey Felix. I have one question about filming with the XS20. The screen of the camera is brighter than the HDMI output to my computer. Do you have a tip on what I'm doing wrong? Um, so here's the thing. <clears throat> like I have a, a an Atomos Ninja monitor that I use sometimes when I'm filming. So uh, 
to the HDMI. But so, but even if you're recording onto a computer screen, for example, you have to not trust the screens because every screen is going to look a little different. So what you should do is you should be using a histogram because if you use the histogram, it's going to show you actual like where the light is. Um, but I mean, this is tricky. I'm more of a, I, I'm, I'm not the best video guy, so this might not be the best answer. I'm more of the stills guy, but that's what I do. I use the histogram and then on the Atomos, which is like a, a small recording device, like a screen that goes on top of the camera, you can, you can export from that and have it do everything you want. Um, but yeah, it's, there's every, every screen, you got to make sure that your screen is, is calibrated properly um, and that your settings are proper. But if you're not sure if it's a little bit of a difference in the brightness, you definitely want to make sure you're trusting the histogram. Uh, and then you can use the, a zebra uh, that will show you like where the highlights are peaking and stuff like that instead of trusting the screen, the screen. So hopefully, Felix, that helps you out. Thanks for joining. All right, let's see. What else do we have here? Well, I sip my coffee. Hang in there. I'm in the wrong place. No, that's the right place. Okay, let's see. All right, so let's get back to some of those questions. Okay, found them. Let's see, what else we have here? Uh, all right, so we did that. Oh, no wonder. I was going the wrong way. Um... Can you post the BTS video from that earlier post? Nice. That's my buddy, Charlie Abrahams. Charlie's a great photographer. He's out in, uh, he's out in um, Boston. Give him a follow, Charlie Abrahams. And Charlie, for you, yes, eventually I will do that. I might add that BTS. He's talking about a portrait I posted the other day. I might add that BTS to a video when I talk about some other stuff. Okay. I think we answered all of those from, those were on my Instagram. Now let's go to my uh, questions from the YouTubes. Let's see. And let's see here. Yeah, Felix, give that a try. See if it helps. Also, you have to remember every screen is different and you'll never get it right on every screen. Right. So Felix, would that's 100%. Um, you have to... You have to make sure that you you don't just trust the screen. You have to trust the you know like like we've been saying the meter, the um, histogram, which will tell you exactly where the darks and lights are. And then in post, you you can if you're if you're sending it out and then you're editing it, then you make sure you edit on a calibrated monitor because you want to you want to edit to what really is correct instead of to just whatever your screen is set up. And it also matters what software you're using too. Like if you're using Adobe Premiere to edit your videos, you're gonna get a very different export than if you're using DaVinci. So there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of things involved that you wanna be on top of, but that's a great place to start. All right, <clears throat> here's a great question. I really like this question. How do you get better at portrait photography when you don't have access to people to practice on? Okay. Well, first of all, um, if you're in anywhere where there's people, you have access to people. Now, if you live in Siberia or Antarctica and you're, and you're in, a, in one of those um, little stations doing science experiments by yourself, then you don't have access to people. But all of us have access to people. So start with friends and family. That's where you start. Uh, when I wanted to learn how to be a portrait photographer, man, I completely hounded my family and friends like every day. I remember at Christmas, I set up a little portrait booth in my basement and, and we all had small kids at the time. So I had to put up like baby barriers so the kids weren't crawling over and knocking over the light stands. And then I forced my uh, my family all to, to come in and have pictures taken. So... That's that's where you start. Now, if you want to photograph non-family and friends, there's actually a lot of Facebook groups that will help you connect with models um, and actors and all of this. So you can do that too. Like I'm in uh, New York models, makeup artists, photographers groups, and you can go in there and find people who are looking for 
you know, to shoot with somebody. So when I was early on starting out, I would do a free shoot. You exchange photos for their time. And that's a great way to build it, build up your brand. Uh, one thing, if you're trying to grow a business, you want to be careful about is you don't want to go out there and like beg people and give away everything for free. And don't be posting like, oh, I'm doing free headshots. Everyone come here. Because if you put that out there, then people are going to just think of you as like the free guy and, and you're going to devalue yourself before you actually make a business. So I would say you just be strategic about it. You don't want to be like, you know, asking everyone to do it publicly. But like, oh, another thing, if you have a friend who has a great look and you say, that person has a cool look, I'd love to have them in my portfolio, you just ask them. Most people love having their picture taken, especially if you make it a good experience. But you got to start somewhere, family, friends. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Hello, Pete. I wear progressive glasses. I find it difficult to get my eye close enough to the EVF to see the full display. I can take them off and use the built-in diopter, but then I can't read the LCD and menus. Any suggestions? Um, no, I have no suggestions for that. So uh, I wear glasses, but they're mainly for for distance. And so when I'm shooting, a lot of times I can use they're not, and I can, you know, I, I sometimes need them, sometimes I don't. But I know, I think you're talking about like the use EVF and then you got to do this, this kind of thing to see the screen. Um, the only thing that I know is just to, to adjust the diopter. I would just adjust the diopter to your glasses if you could. And then you just, then when you move it away, the screen should still look clear. But I'm not sure if there's any actual device out there. Um, I'm, although I'm, I'm, you know, I'm wearing glasses. I'm, I'm in my 40s, so I definitely not don't have the vision I used to have. But that's the best I could do on that. Um, hey, Pete, I'm curious. On your recommendations for tethering during your photo session, do you have an, the image where your subject can see the photo or just you? Is it too much of a distraction? So yes, 1,000% when you tether, don't let them see it because it's a huge distraction. So in my studio, I have this. I have a cart like this. It's got a monitor on it. I put my laptop on there and then I tether. And what I do is I have the monitor facing me. The client cannot see it. Um, and then I take a bunch of pictures because I want to be able to see it so I can tweak it, so I can get them to a, a great spot. I want, I want to be able to get them also where they look great because the first photos, usually you have to get them warmed up. You have to give them a little bit of time. So don't let them see it right away. And then what I do is I periodically bring them out and then I show them once I have a, a shot that I'm like, I know they're going to love this shot. Uh, so that's the better way to do it. Um, and the more you do this, the quicker it becomes for you to be able to get a great shot in a short amount of time. So it's not like I'm not having them back there for an hour and torturing them and then, okay, we finally got a good shot. Come on out. It's, it's not like that at all. It's like, you know, maybe a couple of minutes behind the lights and then I bring them out. Uh, all right, let's see what else we got here. And if you want to ask me a question, throw it in the chat and I will answer it. Ask me about Fuji cameras or portrait photography. Which current future or AI feature would you like to have in a mirrorless camera? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't want any AI. That's me. I want analog, but I'm very old school. Uh, but to, to answer your question, um, I think the only AI I'm interested in when it comes to uh, like using my cameras is really like the autofocus stuff that really makes it easy for the camera to lock on and get to the right spot. Outside of that, I feel like the AI, too much of it, and then what you're just removing yourself from it. So I don't want my camera to have AI features that will like fix things and change lighting and all of this. I want to do that myself, you know? Um, okay. Do do do, do 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 Any more? Let's see. How do you get better at portrait photography? Oh, I guess I answered that one already. Um, curious and recommendations. Okay, so now I think I answered most of the questions that you guys had dropped into the post that I put on there. But so now I'm just if you want me to answer a question. Throw it into the chat. I'm happy to answer that. But I'm going to answer some questions that I get all the time. Okay. And 
one of them is um, how about that Fuji film autofocus? Okay, now um, here's the thing where where we're at, and someone did ask. Actually, I think Ben asked me this question um, in one of the other things that I missed. Where how, how long is it going to take for Fuji film to get their autofocus system to be like Nikon, uh, uh, Canon, or Sony? Um, and I have no idea, and I don't know if it'll ever be there. I think um, I think it's 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 much closer with the XT5 and the X uh, H2 series cameras. That was a big leap forward, um, but it's still not quite as good as my Canon R5 that I use in my studio. Which, um, but hopefully they're gonna get it there. Thomas, hey Thomas, glad to have you here. Which Fuji do you use? In your studio, that's a great question. I have two Fuji cameras that I use in my studio. Um, my main camera that I use is the X-T5, and I only have uh, a couple of lenses that I use pretty much for everything, although I did acquire this lens, which I'll talk about um, just recently. So I use the X-T5 with either the 16-55 to 2.8 lens or the 3514 and this is the old 3514 and i absolutely love this lens for uh portraiture so i'll do even close up headshot kind of frames but also half three quarter full length portraits with this lens i also use the xt4 in the studio and um in this lens i just got and this is the 50 f1 and so far, I'm absolutely loving this lens. It's really great. I, I've been enjoying using it so much. But the reason why I've, I've been using the X-T4 a little bit with this now is because it's pretty bulky. So I have found that I like having this. So I'll actually, in the studio, I'll put on the grip. Um, now on the X-T5, if I use this lens, I have on my small rig uh, steel grip which attaches to the bottom and that definitely helps with the size but I like this when I have this big lens on there I just find this makes it a lot more manageable um, but for the past year the the X-T5 has been my go-to camera uh, I also shoot with a Canon R5 and um, that was the, my that was my main camera for uh, quite a while and over the past year I've kind of used the Fuji almost more than the Canon. Um, I'm still using the Canon sometimes. I find that the where the Fuji lacks is not so much, hang in there. It, I find that the Fuji lacks not so much in terms of detail, like it's very close, but it's the dynamic range that, so here's what you lose with the crop sensor and why I still like shooting with the Canon sometimes, is you lose the dynamic range to a degree, which means you don't have as much dynamic range as you do with the full frame. And then obviously with medium format, you have a lot more. Um, <clears throat> but um, the other thing that I find is that you lose, well, you lose a little bit of the, uh, you, you gain compression. So when it comes to like the wider apertures, you're not seeing as much depth. Maybe not compression is the right word, but the depth is a little bit less. So even on like a one point, and I don't know the math behind this, but, but like a 1.2 lens on a Fuji crop sensor is not going to be quite as much depth of field as the 1.2 on like a full frame sensor. So those are the things that I feel you're kind of losing. And then performance, like the Fuji, when I do like a, a headshot shoot for like 50 people, um, the Fuji can do it, but I find that the Canon is a better tool for that when you're going all day long. Uh, the X-T5, I find that is better for like my slower paced portrait shoots. The autofocus is not as good as the Canon. It's it's much, much better than the older Fujis, but it's still not quite there yet. Um, but but they're, they're definitely improving. All right, Thomas, I use the X-H2 and my X-T3 with the 16 to 55, 3314. Yeah, I love, I want a 3314. I always... I know everyone loves that lens. And the 5612. Yeah, so I had the 5612 RWR. I bought that lens when it first came out. I absolutely love the quality. It's amazing. Beautiful. And I love the size. Like so the 50 F1 
is obviously a lot bigger. It's kind of heavy. Um, but what I didn't like about the new uh, RWR is I found it also to be a little bit, um, the focus was a little clunky on, on and, and it kind of annoyed me a little bit because it was a brand new lens and I just didn't understand why my much older 16 to 55 was focusing faster and quieter. Um, so I still might pick it up at some point. Um, I definitely don't need it, but it's something that uh, I really like the quality of it and the size. But um, I don't know if you have the older or the newer. But I don't think the newer if focus speed and everything is probably not going to do much more than the older did. So, um, But that's, that's why I don't have the 56. Uh, I did love the quality, however. All right, Ben, any desire to try out Sony gear? Um, not really, but I did. I actually did try a Sony. So my, my buddy John... Uh, who is like my co-photographer. We do a lot of gigs together. He And we do a lot of like experimentation together at the studio where we try new lighting techniques and stuff. He's a Sony guy. And he got an A7 III Mark IV maybe. Um, and that's whatever the newer A7 III Mark, whichever it is. And um, Sigma had sent me a 7200 with a Sony mount to try out. And so I tried it. And I... Because I had tried Sony's years ago and I hated it because I felt like it was just like using a, it was like using a Microsoft, you know, uh, Windows computer. It was like the menus were very clunky to me. But the new one was really nice and I found that it was very easy for me to get acclimated with it. Uh, the build quality is amazing. The focus is just incredible. And um, the thing I didn't like about it is I didn't really like the color output. It's, everything seems a little bit more like, I, I don't know... And it could be user error. I only spent like a few days with it. Um, but I found that the colors were a little bit more towards like the browns. And, and I felt like some of it felt a little muddy to me compared to uh, my Canon. And then obviously I, I prefer the Fuji colors above all of that. But but Ben, I was super impressed by the um, by the Sony. And, and I definitely would try it again. Um, I probably will if, if they, if I get a company wants to send me a lens to try out, he's, he'll lend me his camera and I lent him the R5. Um, but I find that the performance is very comparable to the R5 and, um, so it was cool, man. Yeah. I have no, I have no, um, nothing bad to say about the Sony. The colors were different than what I was used to. So you, ha I think that's when it comes to color output from cameras, we say, well, this is better. That's worse. I don't think that's the right way to look at it. I think you have to look at it as each camera will output color in its own way. And now not just each camera, but each camera and each lens combination. So if you buy the the, the uh, manufacturer brand lenses, they're going to be pretty consistent. But then if you put a third party lens, you're going to have some differences there too. So I think it's more important to find the colors that you like out of the gate, but also that you know how to adjust. Because a lot of times, like with my Canon camera, I, I don't like the colors out of the gate, um, especially if it's like an outdoor, uh, just like a natural light shoot. In the studio, I don't care as much. I shoot raw, and then I can tweak it in post. Um, which, but that's actually what I do with the Canon on, on location. And I tweak the Fuji, but when it comes to color, it's a little bit less of adjusting you have to do. So whatever brand you invest in, you have to just understand like, okay, this brand tends to be towards cooler colors. This tends to be towards warmer colors. And then you just have to figure out not only what looks right, but what looks right to you. I love cooler colors. I love shooting most of my work when it comes to my portrait work. I, I love um, to be on the cool side. Even with my headshots where I want a photorealistic look, I don't want it to look color graded. They're still going to be slightly towards the cools because I think the warms don't look as nice. Okay, Andrew. What's up, Andrew? Nice to uh, have you here. I love my Fuji, but lately I have been shooting a lot of concerts and shows, and I wish the low light performance was a bit better. How do you feel about denoise programs like Topaz or, or DxO Pure Raw? I haven't tried Topaz. I I mean, I hear great things about it. So when I denoise my photos, when it comes to low light photos, um, I'm gonna do it. And in, in like two steps. So I have kind of a process that I do, which is first I will, um, first I'll, I'll uh, download everything into Capture One and then I'll denoise, you know, add a little noise reduction there. Um, and then I'll finish off my editing and I do this with my concert photos a lot in Affinity Photo, which is kind of like Photoshop and I'll denoise them a little bit more there. 
Um, I don't like too much denoising because then, you know, it gets that weird sort of smooth look to it. Um, but yeah, and uh, what's up, Lumberjack? Lumberjack 3008, good to see you. Um, Topaz is great, he says, and I've heard awesome things about Topaz, so I definitely want to give that a try. It's on my list. Um, Andrew, I wish I could answer better there. You know what I did do is I did a bunch of concert photography this weekend, and I put some of the photos on, if, you, if you're part of the Fuji X-T5, it's one of the Facebook groups. I threw a bunch of photos in there, and I put all of the um data on them of like what i shot at and i put a few of the i shot some with the xt4 one night and some with the xt5 another night everything with the 50 f1 and um i didn't notice like a monumental difference in the noise so i don't know i know people you find videos and you find people saying the that the 40 megapixel sensor is super noisy and then other people saying there's no neg negligible difference i kind of don't see there to be a huge difference. Maybe there's a little bit of a difference, but um, there you have it. One thing that's cool shooting with the F1 lens is I was able to use a lot lower ISO, so that was fun. Uh, Lumberjack. It's very annoying that there's no fast and silent focusing fast XF prime lens in the range 40 to 80 millimeter. Return to 56. Yeah, that's... I know, I, I returned it too. And I, I don't understand that either. And I think... Like Fujifilm going forward, one thing that uh, I hope that they that they start to understand or start to do is, first of all, if you're going to release a new lens, like it has to have a linear motor. It has to focus fast. I really don't have any clue why that new 56 millimeter, which is a beautiful lens, the quality again is amazing. Why does it have such a such a slow focusing system that I was having it like on the XC5? There was quite a few times where it just doing like a portrait shoot. I was getting some misses, and I was like, well, this really shouldn't be. Uh, so I don't know what the answer is there. Um, and I do know that when it comes to Fuji lenses, there, there is not, I haven't found any consistency when it comes to like which one focuses better. Uh, I'm sorry, like, let me rephrase that. When it comes to Fujifilm lenses, some focus really great and some just don't. And it doesn't matter the camera it's on and it doesn't matter when they were made. So like I was saying before, the 18, uh, 16 to 55, 2, 8, which is kind of my go-to lens, the focus is fast and silent. It's better than some of the newer lenses. Why? I don't know. It's very strange to me. All right, let's see. Okay, Ben, I love my a7 IV. Yeah, that's what I used, Ben. It was awesome. Quickly realized that all camera menus are terrible, but once you get used to it, it's fine. They need to learn from Blackmagic. Those menus are great. Yeah, I mean, I would say Sony definitely is still probably the the most unintuitive menus, and I find the Canon menus are really great. They're very intuitive. Uh, Fuji menus are a big improvement from what they used to be, too. Um, so I, I do like that. I like Fuji menus. And you know what I like about Fuji is that it's simple for me to find my, because I shoot manually 99% of the time I'm shooting manually. So having my shutter speed and aperture and ISO right where, where they are, it just makes it easy for me on the fly. One thing I've been doing, for those of you interested in kind of my workflow when it comes to the camera, is I've been using, um, I love using the physical aperture. I think that's the easiest way. And then I've been using the rear command dial and the front command dial for shutter speed and ISO. And I find that, that that's a pretty good kind of hybrid way of, of doing it. Uh, Andrew, I will take a look at Affini Affinity and those photos. I've recently moved to Capture One. Good, from Lightroom. Um, I'm a bit more comfortable with it. Yeah, and Capture One, for whatever reason, uh, I feel like the Fuji files look much better in Capture One. But yeah, check them out. And you can kind of see some of my... I did a bunch of black and whites, and I did a very high... Uh, contrast editing with deep blacks and stuff like that. Um, Lumberjack, the 50 F1 main goal was to get attention for the XF system, right? Not speed or optical perfection. Speed isn't part of their DNA. Yeah, I, I do understand that. I get that. Um, but Fuji themselves over the past couple of years have like position themselves, especially with the new cameras that came out last year as like, oh, we, we're going to get the AF speed. And you'll see a lot of like content creators like, oh, it's better than the R5. It's better than the Sony, the AF and the XH2S or whatever. So I know they're trying to, to, to be more of that 
get into that realm. Um, and I didn't expect when I picked up the 50 F1, I certainly didn't expect it to be like the fastest focusing. Uh, but I was very pleased with it. Honestly, it's, it's pretty darn good. The focusing is, um, I felt like it was better than the 56 from, from what I remember of how that focused, maybe just a little better. And, um, the, the images are beautiful though. Even at F1, it's, it's quite sharp. Uh, I feel like it really finds its own at around F2 between two and four, but I'm going to, I'm going to do a video on that and talk about all of that soon. Uh, let's see. All right. What else? Anyone else have any pressing questions? Well, while, while I'm waiting in there, I'm going to throw some other common questions. So that's a common question I get. What do you use in your studio? <coughs> Excuse me. So I use an X-T5 primarily and a Canon R5, and it kind of depends on what I'm shooting. So if I'm shooting um, like a family out in a field and they have little kids and they're going to be running around like crazy, yeah, I'm really going to just, sh I'm going to just lean on the R5 because I feel like that's going to be uh, nailing all, and I know it will nail all the focus while kids are running around and stuff like that. Fuji will do a pretty decent job, but you're still going to get misses in there. Um, the biggest difference for me, um, when it comes to in a studio, if I'm in a controlled studio setting and I have one client where I'm not firing off a ton of shots in a row, uh, the Fuji works great. I like the experience of using the Fuji better. I like the user experience. I like the tactile dials. Even on the X-H2, I, I like the, the command dials with a very simple interface where you can see your aperture and shutter speed. The main thing that you're going to have that's different, which I mentioned before when it comes to the Fuji, if you're using Fuji versus a full frame system, is you're losing um, some dynamic range for editing. Uh, and I think that's even more something that I don't, that, that I miss a little bit more than like quality because the quality is pretty darn it's pretty darn close at this point. It's definitely full frame is still going to be better technically if you want to pixel peep and zoom in 500%. But in practical terms, uh, they're pretty darn close. <clears throat> Their lenses are still the bottleneck. Yeah, the development speed is much too slow. They need too much time to update their lenses. That's Lumberjack 3008. Yeah, man, I I agree. I don't know what it is. Um, it is definitely a point of frustration for people. And I feel like... When you go into the Fuji system, you know that you're in, into the X system. You know you're you know you're going to be compromising in certain ways, and every system is a compromise. I know that one thing that I feel like has pushed a lot of people towards Fuji film this year, particularly, uh, is how expensive full frame is, and how expensive like once the 40 megapixel ca cameras came out, and people saw like, okay, well this quality is pretty comparable probably to like what I can get from an R5 or whatever, a lot of people started switching. But Canon kind of, you know, they're still not letting third-party lens makers make lenses for the RF mount. And so they've really, I think, lost quite a few people to other brands because of that. So I know um, anecdotally, I don't, there's nothing scientific about this, but I know a lot of my um, my subscribers and followers on the various socials have told me, yeah, I switched from Canon because of the whole lens thing to, and, and I've gone to Fuji. All right. Cell, hold on, I can't read it. Cell Palaganis. I hope I'm saying that right. Hi, Cell. I'm torn between the XF 33mm and the Viltrox 27mm for street photography. Can you help me out? Also for portrait and everyday shots, by the way, I'm using X-T5. Okay, so portraits, everyday shots, either one of those lenses are going to be awesome. Um, the the 33 millimeter, I feel like is going to be a better all-around range um, because, hold on, let's see, 33, what is that going to be, like a 50? That might be 50 right on the dot, right? So 30, you, when you convert that, 49.5 so that's a 50 millimeter that's my favorite focal length i love 50 millimeter i think that you can do so much with a 50 millimeter you can do group shots you can do close-up portraits you can do small you know small groups you can do half length portraits so i think uh that's probably the the ideal range for that um the 27 i haven't is about a 40 millimeter if you're doing a lot i i would say the 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 40 millimeter is going to be better um for 
things like if you're doing a lot of like uh, travel photography and you want a little bit more of a range. I mean, you're not getting a wide angle there either, but I think you get a little bit more field of view. Quality wise, I, I haven't used either one of those particular lenses, but I know that the 33 is, is I, my friend has it. We actually, he, he, used, he brought it here. We used it um, to do some portraits and it's awesome. 27 Viltrox is probably very good. Uh, I used the 13 millimeter Viltrox and that I absolutely fell in love with. And I actually did, if you want to do like something a little bit more interesting and, and do s different kinds of, of portraits and, and stuff, then I would, um, I would definitely check out even the 13 millimeter. I have a video on it. If you look up my 13 millimeter review, I use it for some like outdoor street portraits and stuff. Um, so... But either one of those are going to be good, Sal. It depends on, you're saying for street, oh, you did say for street photography, then you want the wider, definitely the wider angle. I would probably go with uh, like the 27. But again, both of those are going to do a great job. Uh, oh, yeah, so Ben, yeah, I beat you to it. Yeah, so the RF mount is, I don't think Canon's ever going to open the RF mount at this point. I don't know what, what they're doing. They just don't want anyone making lenses for their cameras anymore. And people are, people are not happy. I know people are not thrilled about that. Um, okay. So that's a question I get all the time. Are you, what are you using in your studio? I get a lot of editing questions. So when it comes to editing, like how do you shoot and, and all of this, <clears throat> I shoot, first of all, if I'm shooting any, Anything in the studio, I'm just shooting in RAW. And then I tether to Capture One Pro. And Capture One, I use for um, kind of, I don't really do a lot of editing in Capture One. I prep images for editing in Capture One. So I'll prep them in Capture One, tweak them a little bit. And then I export them and I use a, a program called Affinity Photo, which I find is such a wonderful program. It's not expensive. It, it's very robust and I can do all my editing in there. Now, if I take a head and shoulders headshot, I don't want those color graded. So they're going to be, um, you know, basically they're going to be real to life. So I don't really adjust the color. I get the color where I need it by adjusting the camera settings and the light and everything. So when I'm taking a headshot, that's, I want to be photorealistic color wise. I make sure I use a certain white balance. I make sure that my lights are set a certain way. Um, distance of the lights, the exposure, and you have, I just do it all in camera. So when I get it, into the uh, editing room, I do very little. One thing I never ever do when it comes to headshots is adjust white balance in post because I feel like that's you're doing it backwards and you're never gonna get like a consistent look that way. So for me, I shoot at a, at a custom white balance of around 4,800 with daylight balanced lights. Um, but then I adjust depending on, on a number of situations, but that's kind of where I start. If I take one of my Fuji bad boys out on the road, uh, like I did a bunch of concert photography this weekend, and what I'll do in that case is I will shoot RAW plus JPEG. And I do this because the one of the beauty, beautiful things about Fuji, as we all know, is we have film simulations that just rock. And so <clears throat> often I don't even need to go to the RAW files when I do that. Um, like I did a bunch of concert photos, I did a bunch of street portraits this weekend, and I just basically shot on a film sim. So most of my shot on Acros, which is my favorite film sim, and then I tweaked them in post a little bit, and that's how I did it. And I just and sometimes the JPEGs look great, and you just you just use those. Uh, so that's how I'll do it when I'm in the wild. But one thing I love is even on Provia, when you're using your Fuji camera on its regular, you know, regular old normal film sim. If you're outside doing like families um, on a nice day or, or, or whatever, like if you're doing family portraiture or any kind of stuff like that, the colors look beautiful. So um, one other thing I do is, um, which I'm going to do another video on soon, is I also use film simulations by a company called Dehancer. It's D-E-H-A-N-C-E-R. And Dehancer reached out to me a couple of years ago already. It was one of the first people who reached out to me and asked me to do a video on their product, and, and, um, and they gave me a promo code. So if you check out Dehancer Film Simulations, um, 
they're really awesome. They've got like 70 or 80 film sims of all all these classic Fuji and Kodak and Agfa films and even some that you may have never heard of films. And they, I like that because sometimes when I'm stuck in an edit, I'm not sure what I want it to look like. I just put it into Dehancer and then I can try out all these different sims, find a look I like, tweak it back in Affinity and I'm done. And I don't have to manually color grade. Um, but if you're a Fuji person, check them out. And I think... I do have a promo code. It's just my name, Peter Coco, I believe is a promo code. If you decide to to pick that up, definitely use the promo code. But that's what I do. Um, do you use recipes at all or just the same? Yeah, I haven't gotten into the recipe stuff yet, uh, Ben. I don't, because you know why I haven't done that? It's because I do a lot of color grading manually in post. So if you look at any of my studio, like post portraits that I, that I do, um, most of those are manually color graded by me. Sometimes I'll use uh, Dehancer that I just mentioned. Sometimes I'll use another great source of LUTs, but I think they only work in Affinity. Is from my uh, my mentor for portraiture that I mentioned early on in the in the stream, Ivan Weiss. Um, he has a LUT pack, Ivan Weiss London, and that's awesome too. Sometimes I use those, but. Um, I haven't gotten into the, I probably should, I've been thinking about like trying to come up with my own recipes, but we'll see. Right now, I I just like to manually grade and tweak stuff. Uh, one thing that I did this weekend that I found worked really well is I shot everything in Acros and then I tweaked it in Capture One, exported it to Affinity, and then I, I kind of did um, this contrast and brightness application to those files and I got them to really pop so that might be my go-to way of doing it but I'm not sure if I could take whatever I did there I could probably turn it into a LUT in um, Affinity but I don't think I could turn it into a um, into a film sim so so I my my favorite film sims that I use I love classic neg I love uh, classic chrome I love acros and I usually use I think it's with the green filter. Hold on, I'll tell you in a second here. So yeah, Acros with the green filter is what I use pretty much for all my black and white. Sometimes I use Eterna. Um, and uh, I love Classic Chrome, as I said, and I love the um, Classic Negative as well. So yeah, there you, there you have it. Uh, what else? So we've been going almost an hour. I thank you, everybody who joined me for this. This is awesome. And I love people that you're asking me questions. And this is so much fun. I'm really enjoying this. So I'm definitely going to do this again. All right. Anyone else have any any questions for me? I know tonight's a big night, right? Uh, I think it's tonight or tomorrow morning. But I think in on the East Coast, I'm pretty sure the Fuji X Summit is going to start like in the middle of the night. So I might come back and, and stream a little bit of that and hang out there and uh, and talk about whatever Fuji's talking about. Um, one thing that I'm very disappointed in, if you follow Fuji Rumors, they are saying that he's the Fuji Rumors guy is saying there's no X-Pro4 coming, uh, and he seems pretty sure about it. And that kind of makes me sort of sad because that was the one thing I was really excited about. I'm not... I'm not as excited about a new X100. I think it's great, but I like the um, the T series and the and the and the Pro series better, just because I like changing lenses so much. So that is something that hopefully <clears throat> maybe they'll surprise us and and we'll see some other cool stuff. But I'm not sure what else they're going to be announcing. I know that uh, the X100 six i believe is is the big thing that they're coming out with so i'll probably be doing some streaming when that happens and uh i think is it tonight it's either tonight or tomorrow at like for me east coast it'll be streaming at like 12 30 at night but i think it's tonight monday at 12 30 streaming like you know into tuesday morning uh so i'll probably hop back on for that if anyone's around uh what else I think that's uh, yeah. We're we're probably in probably in good shape. I'll I'll leave. Uh, I'll keep yapping for a couple more minutes just in case anyone else wants to ask me a question. The whole point of this stream was just to answer your questions about Fujifilm, about portraiture, whatever, any kind of photography related questions. So I'll show you though. 
what I have here that I still use sometimes, which I love. I mean, even though it's the interface is kind of kind of a dog nowadays, it's slow, is the X Pro One. So this was the first Fujifilm camera that I purchased many years ago with the uh, 35 millimeter f1.4. And I bought both of these used. It was probably already five or so years old. Um, you know, and I love this camera. The X-Pro1 is still a great camera. It uh, It's 12 megapixels, I believe. It works really, really great. And I love the look of the files. And I love the black and whites from that. So I'll, I'll often take this and I'll throw it in my base case when I have my upright base and I'm going to a gig. And I actually put it in a pocket in the base case, take it with me because it's so compact. So I'm still using the X-Pro1 and that's a lot of fun too. Uh, Andrew, thanks for joining us, man. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, make sure, so everybody who's in here, do me a huge favor. Make sure you're following my channel. It amazes me how many people watch my videos, but many of them are not followers. They're not subscribing, I should say, to the channel. So make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel because, you know, the number of subscribers as any one of us who is in this YouTube uh, content creator land knows, the subscribers make a big difference in you as the creator having the time and the energy and and the resources to um, you know do this. It's a lot of time, and I know most most of us who are camera lovers uh, who have uh, uh, thanks thanks Ricardo, I appreciate that. Um, who who love cameras and do this we do it because we're passionate about like I started this channel because I love photography that's really I didn't have any other goals besides that and even now I feel like the more I do it the more passionate I get about being a photographer and um you know and 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 even just sharing with people so I love sharing stuff with you guys um and if you want, if you have, I know there's some people who had asked me other questions, which are awesome, which are, require me to make a video. So like one thing I want to show you, hang in there, I'll be right back. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I had to go find this. All right, here's one thing that um, I'm definitely going to do a video on that I, I've been asked many times. Using a flash with Fujifilm cameras, right? Now, it's, it's so cool because, um, you know, you can do everything you can do with any other camera when it comes to Fuji cameras, when it comes to using flash. I picked this flash up maybe... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, it's a Godox. Can you see that? I don't know if it's going to focus on it, but it's a Godox V1, and I really like it. And and so I'm going to make a video on using uh, flash with your Fuji camera. Um, and this is cool because I, I use this for some of my street portraits, and uh, there's a number of ways you can use it. TTL, you can use it. I'll talk about using it automatically, but also some cool tricks to using it. Uh, more creatively and manually. So that's a big issue that I want to talk about in a video using flash with Fujifilm. Another thing people ask me to do a specific video on shooting portraits with a Fujifilm camera. And at first I thought about that. I'm like, well, I'm not really sure. Uh, like if you're shooting portraits, it's more about shooting portraits. But the more I thought about that topic, I've, I've realized that actually that's a really cool topic because there's ways that we'll use these cameras uh, and lenses when it's Fujifilm. And I use it a little differently than if I use a different camera. And then you got to play to the strengths of what the camera has. So that's another video in the works. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just working on it. Uh, I really appreciate everybody. Thank you so much for hanging in hanging in there and joining me today uh oh dan i see your comment i have that godox v1 i'd love to know more about all the attachments that go on the front yeah there are some cool attachments this one came with it has that little dome so i could talk about that stuff too and um and then also like you can talk about like you know just why does it do this <laughs> why does it do that there's reasons there's reasons um, so that's, I think that'll be a fun topic and, uh, but feel free to 
leave me comments here if, if there's something else you want me to talk about. Um, some of the best ideas I get come from people leaving me comments and saying, hey, you know what would be cool if you spoke about this or that. Uh, so uh, make sure everyone, thank you for subscribing. And don't forget also to um, follow me on Instagram and on all those other Twitter and stuff like that. Hey, Enrique. Enrique says, I've been using Affinity Photo for a long time. It's really great. But recently I got a new computer. And now when I edit, my final image has multiple horizontal thin white lines. Any ideas? Whoa, no. I have no idea. That's I would contact Affinity and see. There's That's really strange. Uh, I use Mac. So I couldn't help you out there. I'm sorry. Um, let's see. Greg. Hey, Greg. This was excellent. I normally nap after lunch, but couldn't because you're so good at this. Wow. That's a huge, that's a huge compliment, Greg. If I can, I've, if my, if this is making you not nap, not fall asleep, that's great. I appreciate that. Ricardo, thank you, P. I've learned a lot from you. Oh, thanks, everyone. I appreciate you all so much. All right. So I think let's wrap it up because I'll, I'll just keep going all day. Um, so this will pop up on, I guess on YouTube. And then I will, uh, as I said, I'll probably going to see you guys later for the Fuji X summit. I'm going to see if I can stream it. I might be hopping on somebody else's stream that you all know, uh, to talk with him, but we will see what happens. Um, there's no confirmation on that. So I don't want to say anything more than that. But everyone, I'm going to sign off. Here's wishing you an awesome day.